Hi everyone! Thank you for joining the show again, and appreciate a lot that you take some time to listen to our expert and our guest speakers.、Uh, today is a wonderful day, and we having David on the show. So, hello, David. How are you doing?、Uh, hello, I'm I'm doing very well, and I am so glad to be with you both. We are we we are so much of. You know, grateful to have you on the show, and it's our culture that our guests and our speaker can introduce about themselves, and they're going to be honored for us. Would you please share with us a bit about yourself, Dave? Absolutely. So,、uh, my name is David Dai. I'm the president of a global leadership development firm called Let's Grow Leaders, and we work with leaders around the world to help them、uh, get you know breakthrough results. They can be very proud of, but in a human-centered way. So we like to say, you know, helping managers get results without losing their soul or their mind at work. So that's the work we do. Also, an author, I've written、um, six, five, six books, and working on another one right now. Wow! Wow! Hey, David, you have a phenomenal career and journey that you share with us about yourself in less than a minute. And so this conversation, we're gonna. Dive in deeper to to explore more about the journey that led into what you are doing today, and I know that Karen is、uh, she's left for the weekend to Boston already. So you leave you with us the whole day today, all right? <laughs> she she her last words as as she walked out the door is, "Oh, you're going to enjoy your conversation. That they're they're good folks. So she trusted you." <laughs> please tell her that we say hello also, please. All right. I will. I will do that. Yes, hey, David.、Um, we, in, we believe that every every things always has the beginning. So、uh, let's travel time together、uh, in this conversation.、Um, Vivian, when she was young, she wanted to become a singer, and life did not give her any chance to do,、uh, you know, to perform on stage except at home. So we sing a lot of karaoke at home, and. When I was young, I, I I wanted to become an astronaut. Life also hit me hard, so I didn't get a chance to do anything close to、uh, to what I wanted to be doing. So, David, we want to know when you was young, what was your dream about the future, though? I'm going to answer that in several ways. If I go very young, I had、uh, two professional desires,、uh, and I didn't know. I actually had an orange, a fruit. That I colored a face on each side, and depending on what, what day and how I was feeling today, I wanted to be this, and then I would turn it if I wanted to be that. And、uh, one was a、uh, professional football player, uh, soccer, uh, so international football,、uh, and、uh, so that was one. And then the other was to be a forest ranger. So、uh, you know, in the United States, in the national parks, somebody who is patrolling the forests and. I love nature and animals and the trees and the mountains and、uh, so that was those were two goals I had. Well, I learned very early I was not going to be a professional footballer. I am not athletic that way.、Uh, that that wasn't for me.、Uh, I did pursue the the forest and、uh, environmental sciences all the way into university and、uh, realized that. I didn't want to take the other classes, the biology classes about like cells and blood and human anatomy. I don't know any of that,、uh, and I changed my major to political science、uh, because that's another fascination that I have had since I was very young.、Uh, I remember age eleven or twelve, I would write a question to myself like, "What is the best way for us to work together, to live together?" Uh, even as a child, I was thinking about those questions, and they continue to fascinate me. And that's been my life's work in many ways: is、uh, leadership development, investing in people, helping people become the best version of themselves, and in that, helping organizations to thrive and, and do good work as well. At the age of eleven and twelve, you ask yourself that yeah, big、yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did. Sometimes people are surprised to hear that, but、uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> Why did you ask yourself know, that question back then? Did you remember? Uh, I was the oldest of six children, so I had leadership naturally given to me.、Uh, let me say, I had responsibility given to me when I was young. I wasn't a great leader.、Uh, one of my earliest memories of leadership is. Uh, my dad left for the day, 
and said, can you get the house clean? And the house was a mess. Uh, and so I'm 11 years old. Uh, what do I know? So I, I thought for a while and I said, I've got it. I figured it out. And I had everybody come downstairs. We had a, a main level and then there was a, a downstairs basement level. And once everybody was downstairs, I gave them assignments. And then I locked the door and said, you can come out of the basement once it's clean. I'll just keep you locked in there until you get it done. I do not recommend that as a strategy, but that's what I did. So I was, you know, I let them out eventually. And then you start realizing, oh, that didn't work. What happened the next time they locked me in the closet? You know, like that, that is, a, and so I started, okay, this isn't working. Well, how can we do this? What does work? So I started asking those questions pretty early. Wow. <laughs> and then, then from the first, um, experience of leadership and then you, now you have you are the president of the let's grow leaders uh, company so the, the the journey is totally different T can you tell us how how the journey took place at the beginning after you finished your uh, university sure so uh i was working on a master's degree uh at university at the same time i was very young i i ran for elected office i was uh, uh 20, 19, 20 years old when I was appointed to a, a planning commission role in a city. Uh, and then when I, as soon as I was 21 of uh, legal age to do it, I ran for election and I got elected to a city council. Uh, and so I had some community leadership that way. And then um, coming out of university, I got my, uh, I was working on a master's degree in education and I was hired by a, an NGO, uh, a nonprofit in the United States that worked with uh, young people who are in poverty and you know, very hard circumstances in life. Uh, and so I was asked to use my education uh, and the, the education degree that I had to, to th that work to help them, but also um, a mentoring, counseling, leadership development aspect as well. So. Uh, and I did that work for 17 years wow. and that organization started in one city, but then grew around the, the country. And through that process, I was doing so much leadership development uh, and it started with me. So asking those same questions, I was promoted to my first leadership assignment of, I had a team of three other people. I was 20, how old was I? 25 years old about. And I had not led in an organization, a business context. I had not done that. So I'm trying to figure out, it's asking the same question. How do we do this? So I went to the library and I see the, the books on your shelf behind you. And I would check out a whole shelf of books. So like, imagine just take that whole top shelf of books. That's all the leadership management books I could get. I would check out all of them that they would allow me to take. I would go, I would read them. I would take notes, think about what we should do take them back, get the next shelf, <laughs> take notes, read them, figure out what you, so I learned as much as I could that way, started implementing those things. Well, as I did that, I was then given more responsibility and, and until I ended up as chief operating officer uh, and then CEO for the national organization. Uh, and so had a variety of different leadership assignments along the way. And, then ultimately, when I got to the end of that time, decided to start my own business, doing what it was that I most enjoyed, which was helping people become the best version of themselves and doing that investing and teaching um, of those leadership and management techniques, all the things that I had learned and invented and figured out along the way to try to pass that on. Wow, beautiful. Hey, David, we have a lot of executive friends uh, who, who, who lead in organization and by the time that they retire, there's a few things, uh, there are two things in common they share with us about their regrets. Uh, first one is uh, it's about starting their own companies when they had time, you know, when they were uh, y uh, younger so that they can share with the world, they can use the expertise and share, you know, and, and help other uh, people. And the second one is um, is writing a book and share their stories and experience. So you do both of them very nicely. I want to go to the entrepreneurship first. All right. So back then you've been holding a leadership role and 
everything was very stable, right? You have uh, you in the very 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 comfort area. But why did you decide to leave and start your own company? Uh, it's such an interesting question. If you had talked to me five years before I left, uh, hey, are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to start your own business? I said, oh no, absolutely not. What happened was I started. No surprise at this point, you know me. I started reading, uh, and I was reading about people who had done that, and um, and specifically in the kind of work I liked doing, and the consulting and coaching and speaking and, and and writing and sharing those ideas. And I realized that there was a business available there. Mm. So one was I started having some vision that it was even possible. The other thing that happened was I started coming to a point internally where I had to, and I don't know quite how to explain this except to say I started to have an unrest oh. inside that if I didn't do this, I was no longer in alignment with my own, with myself. And so the easiest way I can explain it is I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> if that's a hard explanation, I know. Uh, how do you analyze that? I'm an analytic person, uh, but that was the reality. It, it became a growing awareness. It took several years. I tend not to do things quickly. I tend to think and process, and uh, but it took three or four years for that to build in me and realize this is what I need to do. And it, was it unstable? Absolutely. I saved up some money. I had some money available um, that I had saved up for all those years. Uh, saved money, got my, my daughter into uh, university, and so then I had enough money left that I was like, okay, I can start something um, and have a little bit of cushion to, to be able to do that. And like so many other things, if I had known all of the challenges and everything else, I either would have waited longer and saved more money or maybe not have done it. Like, it is hard. It's not easy. So... You know, but I think so many things in life, if we wait until we're just fully ready, you know, you never take the leap. So, um, yeah, it was good that I did. Well, did you still remember the moment on the day that you say today is the day, today is the day that you started your own company? How do you feel on that day? Oh, so excited. So excited. Yes. I remember the day that I registered uh, my company with the government. Uh, it was uh, April uh, April in 2012 was the day that I did that. Uh, and then the day that I left, I, mean, I can tell you the exact day and time. I left my final day in, in that role was July 31st of 2012. And I finished the day at 11.30 a.m. in the morning. And I said goodbye to everybody, got in the car, and I drove to a seminar where there was a longtime expert in our city teaching a course in some of the things I wanted to do. So I left, walked out the door, drove to a class to start learning more about what I was doing next. <laughs> so, so in your plan, what was your plan of doing next, uh, David, back then? The plan of what I was going to do next was to help people, as I said, become the best version of themselves in uh, a combination of coaching, consulting, uh, leadership development, and training, um, those kinds of expertise. And I did all of that. I facilitated uh, strategic planning sessions for boards. Uh, I took any work I could get related to that arena. I would, I would coach individuals. I coached small business owners. I coached uh, leaders who were growing in their, their business and needed help. I consulted with uh, other uh, organizations, nonprofits, uh, a global engineering firm. Um, that was a fascinating engagement. Uh, and so any of that kind of work that I could get, that was the plan. Take all of it I can get and then start moving, start growing and see what happens. And and, write, and writing the book along the way. <laughs> We're going to get to the writing really, really uh, soon. I, I want to ask you one more question uh, before we move to the writing part, okay? Because a lot of people out there want to start their own company. So starting is mm -hmm. really hard to start from zero to one. I want to I want you to remember back when you first having your first client. Can you share who's, you know, about that with with the audience so that 
give them the strength to walk the path though. Yeah. Very, very first client was a woman by the name of Jennifer. Uh, and it was a small engagement, but she said, you know, I know that you know something about this topic, the thing that she needed help with. She said, I have got a meeting of uh, stakeholders for my company. Uh, it's three hours away from where you live. Would you be willing to drive? I can pay you this, uh, reimburse for gas and pay you this amount. Uh, can you come and do that? Uh, and I said, I'd be happy to. <laughs> and that recognition. So, and that's the thing I would say as, as you're thinking about doing something, any business, you have to be fulfilling a need that customers have. And so you have two choices. You can meet a need that they know they have, or you can help them realize a need they don't know they have, but now they do. So if we think about the iPhone, nobody needed an iPhone before there was an iPhone, but once we knew it was there, everybody needs a smartphone, right? That, that kind of thinking. So for the kind of work I'm doing, people know they need it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a matter of being clear that I've got those ways of helping. So for, for me, um, content marketing, but that's a fancy word, but I say writing blogs and writing articles and sharing those with the world and on social media, that's how I started. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I still get work that way today. But um, putting those answers to questions I know people have and helping them that way, um, to me, that's a, a way to start a business. Now, if you're doing, if you're building a product or uh, software or anything like that, what is the need that you're solving that people are going to be willing to pay for because you're making their life better, easier in some way, or helping them achieve a goal or a, a dream or solve a problem? Any of those, uh, those are the places I'm looking if I'm going to be starting a business and then you know, and can you do it? Then you got to figure out all of the, the numbers have to work, but at the core, that's what it's all about. Beautiful. Since you mentioned about that, I have another question before we move to the, to the piece of, of the booking. Okay. At the books. So, um, you mentioned a lot of change happened to you because you reading, you went to the library and reading a lot of books about leadership, personal developments. And th there seems to be some secret in the way that you're reading, so that uh, so that you will be able to see uh, you know something in there that also help you to to realize there's a potential market that 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 the people in needs for this kind of service that you are doing and then you start your own company also years after so teach us what is the secret in the way that you read David mm. I haven't thought about that before. Mm. I think I read in many ways. Sometimes I read to explore, uh, you know, a new idea, a concept I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, and, and by the way, this is very much my personality. This might work for me. It might, not, it might not work for somebody else, but I'll read to explore a new idea. And I don't know what the application is going to be. Uh, you know, I read about the how octopus <laughs> think and interact with their world because they're so different than any other creature right um, and then I'll read about uh, when I have specific challenges so I'm not that's reading to explore but over here I'm reading to specifically learn and solve problems uh, so right now I'm reading uh, two different books that are about uh, business growth because every business has a life cycle and so you start early and then you build and then uh, you get to some instability and then hopefully you get to a good place of stability. From there, it's often common that you'll come to a place where you get rigid and start to decline because you're too set in your, your ways. And if you're not careful about fixing that, then you can decline all the way down to, to stop uh, and the business dies. So I'm reading a couple of books about that and about the ways that different business operators work together. So those are because I want to um, invest in the success of our business and, and be thinking about specific problems and challenges. Um, and then I read for fun. Uh, so the exploration is for fun, but sometimes just this is fascinating to me or I'll read, I'll read fiction that, you know, in a variety of different things. So, I read because I enjoy it, but I also read to explore and I read to solve problems. And what I would tell you in terms of 
You're asking the secret of how I read? One is I'm always thinking about how, how what I'm learning here, how I can use it, um, how I can incorporate it. Is there something here for me? Um, a practice that I have had for many, many years is I highlight if I'm reading a, a physical book, uh, like, you know, that's a, a physical book, I will underline, highlight, circle, and then I go back and I have a, an Evernote is where I keep it, but I have a database of all of the quotes of anything I've ever read. Uh, and so anything that I highlight, I will then put into that system. Now, if I'm in uh, a Kindle, uh, my you know, e-reader from Amazon, you can highlight there and it saves them all. And then I will take all of those and put them into the same system. So I'm always kind of collecting thoughts that have made a difference or that struck me in the moment. And then the, the last part I would say is I try to use that knowledge. Mm. You can read, and I've met people like this, and I've been this person too, you can just read so much. And do I really need to read all of that? Or is it more about using a couple of the key ideas that are going to make a big difference for me? Yeah. So, for instance, uh, I just got to meet someone who I have really respected. Uh, his name is David Rock. And he's the founder of the Neuro Leadership Institute. And so he has studied leadership from a, a neuroscience perspective. Mm. Um, what is happening in our brain to be effective leaders to lead effectively with organizations, to bring out the best in people. He's like, you know what, all of it, I want to know what's happening in the brain. So we're doing this from a scientific basis, and it's truly human-centered. And I have admired and respected his work for many, many years and used a lot of it in my own, it's informed a lot of my own approach. Well, I got to meet him last week uh, in person. He was at a conference, so I got to, to talk to him and, and have several conversations. And I realized through those conversations that I needed to go back and reread and reapply some elements of that. So it's been 10 years since I'd read his work. How much am I still using? So that's the final element I would say is there's read, 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 note, take notes and all the different ways you might do that. But then what are you going to use and how are you going to use it? And if I can take something and start applying it, What's the one idea from a book or the two ideas from a book that I want to start applying? Um, and, and I say one or two because if you try to take 17 different things, it's too much and you're not going to be able to do any of it. But if I can choose one or two and put them into my work or my life, then it's good. Beautiful. David, thanks a lot for, for sharing the three things that you do when you're reading. And uh, the last piece is very critical because, you know, a lot of people reading and not doing anything about that. A lot of ideas, thought, but never execute anything at all. So it became in a waste, right? So thanks for yeah, sharing. Yeah, you know, the, the other thing I'd say about that is there's another type of reading I do as I'm thinking about it, and that's reading for inspiration. Oh. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, you know, I will read about, um, I, I, I'm developing into a runner. I, I don't know that I'm a runner yet, but I just did my first ultra marathon last year. Oh. did uh, uh, a 50K, 50 kilometers, uh, yeah, which was so fun. But sometimes I'll read about runners and their journeys, not to learn a specific technique or how to do it, just for inspiration, just for motivation. And so that's another way of reading in business or life or, or anything. So I had that too. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. And that is the purpose of what Vivian and I are doing. So we're running these shows to bring your stories as a way to motivate and inspire people so that they can, you know, have the courage to do what they are doing. And since I mentioned the word courage, I just want to share with you that the past couple of months in Asia, you know, specifically in Vietnam, there's a lot of seminars, a lot of, you know, like get off meetings by, you know, big companies and the word courageous has been mentioned in a lot. So whenever we uh, we attended those kind of meetings, I always remember about your book, uh, writing with caring about courageous, right? So uh, let's talk about the journey of writing, okay? Yes. So by the time that you left organization, starting your own company, how the path of writing came in, in between came? Yeah. 
So I actually started uh, writing a blog, I want to say 20, uh, 2009. So this would be three years before I ended up leaving and starting my own business. And I started that blog because I was teaching leadership, teaching management, but as the organization grew, there was, I couldn't spend enough time with people. Uh, you know, the United States is a big place. I could not get around to everybody. I couldn't talk on the phone with everybody. So what could I do? I started writing uh, and I would write three times a week. Um, and so two of those would be wisdom lessons I wanted to share. And then every Friday I would write a book review. So, you know, I had read many, many leadership books, so I wanted to share some of what I found useful about those and highlight those. Plus, it was a way to build relationships with other leadership authors. Uh, and they say, oh, thank you for promoting my book. And then they would promote my blog. And, you know, and so it would work nicely that way. Um, so I started doing that for three years uh, before I went out on my own. And I actually had, like, as I mentioned, Jennifer, who was the first client I ever had. I, she asked me to come and do that. I hadn't even left my company yet. Uh, so I took a day off from work to go to her thing, hey, you know, take PTO to do that. Um, so that was the start of writing was consistently getting, and, and I think consistency is part of the key. Hmm. Uh, people, I, I get asked about writing all the time by people who say, hey, I, I want to write, I want to do a book, I want to do what you do. And... The number one thing, I, if you think you're a writer, writers write. Writers write. So write every day, three times a week, whatever your practice is to be disciplined about that and keep to it. Some days you're going to write stuff you don't like, and that's okay. You have to write that in order to write the good stuff. Uh, and so I remember a conversation that I was having with a very good friend of mine who is a science fiction author. And we were having a beer one afternoon, and I this was before I started the blog. So this would have been, you know, maybe summer of 2009. I said, I really want to write. I want to write. I want to do this blog, but I'm worried. He said, What are you worried about? And I said, Well, I'm worried that my thoughts, whatever I write today, it's not going to be good enough for what I believe in three years from now. But now it's out there. And if I wait three years, I'm going to know more. I'm going to learn more. I'm going to write better. And the, the way, and without using the, the bad words, but the, the way that he said it is, you know, you're right. Some of what you write is going to be crap. It's going to be bad. But you have to write the bad stuff in order to write the good stuff. Amazing. So start. And you know what he did? He gave me permission to be bad that I didn't have to be perfect, that I didn't have to do everything right the first time. And I needed that. It like unlocked a, a door for me and I stepped through it and I was like, oh, great. And I started writing. And so have written, I don't know, but you, Karen and I together, we've written so many thousands of, of blog posts and articles. And, and then when I went into business on my own, I really wanted to write a book to codify some of my thinking uh, and to represent uh, my thinking around some of those core leadership principles. And so I started writing that book um, and I can go into that process, but I, let's see where you want to take the question next. Mm. David, when you were really, really young, you had a dream of becoming a, in like a, a international soccer, uh, right? or uh, a, a forest ranger and then come to you know like uh, uh, you know leadership development because you know into to the political science that was never in the interest of begin becoming an author or you know becoming a writer whatsoever i want to bring you to the summer the summer before um before july my, my, that might not be true i might i might have always wanted to be an author uh i think Oh, you do? Uh, I think so. It was not a profession that I imagined as a career goal. It was something that uh, I've loved reading since I was a child. And so the idea of writing a book, I always wanted to. Um, but there were two things that I thought. One was uh, my writing teachers at, in school when I was young came from a tradition that they didn't 
reward creativity. They were only looking at the punctuation and the grammar. And so that squelched my um, creative writing pretty early. I now write creatively on my own just for fun, but it took me a while to get back to it. And then there's nonfiction writing. And this is the way I thought it's, it's pretty funny. The way I thought about it was, you know, I have to live a while before I can write nonfiction. You know, there's these people that try to start writing nonfiction when they're 20 years old. I'm like, I'm 20. I don't know anything. This is the way I thought when I was 20. I'm like, I'll wait till I'm, once I get to 40, then I'll know enough to start sharing it with the world. Mm. Well, I actually started about when I was 30. Uh, uh, and I was, uh, I went to a, a, a meeting, I think it was at a church I went to, and I heard somebody talking about sharing what you have to share with the world. And it was another one of those where it was like, okay, I need to start writing. So I always had wanted to write, but I never saw it as a career path. Uh, now I, it's so integrated in, in that <laughs> career. Absolutely. But it took some encouragement, some motivation, some unlocked doors to allow me to get there. Who was the gentleman that had beer with you in that summertime? Yeah, his name is Matt. Matt. Uh, he is, yeah, he's, he's probably my very best friend, uh, apart from my wife, you know, <laughs> uh, I've known him since, uh, seventh grade. Well. Why did you choose to talk to Pat and to Matt and ask him about writing? Uh, because he was a writer himself, uh, uh, and he had been a writer since I'd known him. I mean, in in high school, we went to to uh, seventh, eighth grade, all the way through twelfth grade uh, in the U.S. together. And the whole time I knew him, he was always writing something, um, um, stories, fiction, always poetry, you know. Uh, And, and then he was, uh, he got to write other things. He is a published, uh, science fiction author and editor. And, uh, so he had experience and whenever I want to learn something, I try to talk to somebody who has experience. Beautiful. It's not, not only that he had the experience, but also he, he was so kind to give you the courage to, and the permission to be bad also. Right. So that is, that's starting the yeah. whole career for you to 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 you know that started open the doors for you to you know start the writing and that's how you know all the books being introduced so congratulations send our regards to Matt for being so kind to to give you a good words of advice and good support back then okay i will i will do that i happen to know that today he is at a conference in denver colorado about writing and he's on a panel sharing some of his thoughts about writing so I will send him a message and let him know. <laughs> All right. How do you feel after writing, you know, five, six books together with Karen already? How do you feel about that? Yeah, some of the books have been uh, books I've written on my own and some of them we have written together. And she also has written one on her own. And it is, uh, you know, how I feel about that is it's amazing how much you can write and there is still more to write. <laughs> There's still more to say. <laughs> Our son often asks us, how on earth do you guys write so much? Don't you run out of ideas? You know, and it's interesting because no, we really don't. I mean, there's always another, somebody needs help in a new way, a different way, another problem to solve, another way to express. Um, and the other thing is that I may have written something three years ago, but only so many people saw it. So sometimes things need to be said again or in a different way. Mm. So, There is so much more to be said and so many more. Um, Karen and I are working on a book right now about conflict in the workplace. Mm. But after that one, if you were to ask both of us what other books we might want to write, we probably each could list maybe two or three different books that we might write in the future after this one. <laughs> let's, let's stop before we go into the, uh, to the, the book about conflict, okay? Since you mentioned about the words ideas, And you and Karen have endless ideas where a lot of people have zero clue about the ideas, you know, or, you know, come up with ideas seems to be very, very hard for them. How, in what way that you and Karen can nurture and create, you know, and, and grow ideas together? Mm. There, there is a lot in that question. Um, it's interesting because Karen and I both have a lot of ideas and we come to them differently. Mm. 
Karen is a visionary. Uh, she can really see things that don't exist and opportunities and, and kind of create things and, and so on. My ideas come a little bit more, um, I would say, practically sometimes where she can see into the future and see something that doesn't exist and say, let's make that. For me, it's more a process of seeing, connecting with people and seeing what they need and what's going to help them and how how could this be better? How could this be more effective? And as I ask myself those questions, I start to, to come up with solutions to those and that start coming up with ideas about what we might try, how we might do that. And as Karen and I work together, and this can be very powerful uh, for those of you that you were asking earlier about starting your own business, mm. um, there, are, there tend to be two types of people. Uh, there's in small startup businesses, you've got the visionaries, and you've got the operator, the person who integrates everything. Mm -hmm. um, Karen is the visionary, I'm that operator integrator in our business. And that, that uh, ability to integrate can be really, really powerful in the nurturing of ideas. Now part of it is, okay, you have to filter because Karen will have 100 ideas, I'll have 10 or 15 ideas, but now we have to take those 115 ideas and you can only do two or three of them, so you have to choose, okay, let's filter through and develop some ways of thinking about which of those ideas is going to help us get where we want to go to, to help the most amount of people, to serve our business, our team, uh, and so forth. So that, that process of looking at what could happen, looking at what needs to happen, and then choosing the ideas that are going to be the most effective. That's at the high level, that's how I would describe it. So how, with that personality differences, how would you and, and Karen be able to deal with conflicts or get into agreements when she has so many ideas to run and you are really a practical person to, to evaluate ideas and see what works and what not? You know, you have to have respect uh, for one another and curiosity um, for one another. And I, I think part of the answer and we have spent a lot of time thinking about this question that you're asking and learning about our own process. And so I would say a couple things to, to people like me. If you're more of the practical kind of person who is thinking about the operations and making everything work and you've got somebody who's an idea person, it's easy for them to feel like you're very negative. Um, why are you so negative? You just say no to everything. I was <laughs> at this conference last week talking to somebody like that. He's also at a husband-wife team, and he's the practical one. He said, my nickname is Dream Killer. I'm the Dream Killer. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were laughing. But the idea is I'm not trying to kill any dreams. What I, what I want to do is use language like this. Wow, I, that's an interesting idea. That's, that's a fun idea. And so first I'll just – let it sit, just acknowledge, wow, that's a fun idea. And some of those just float away. They're like butterflies or clouds, like, oh, there's an idea, and it, and it goes on. Other times, then there's going to be some that um, she might bring two or three or four times. Like, okay, she really cares about this one. This is a real one. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about it. Now, I may immediately, what happens in my brain typically is I go, oh, okay, if we're going to do that, well, here's two problems. Here's another thing we're going to have to figure out. Like, in the moment of the idea, that's what's happening in my brain. I'm already having all of that happening. Like this, that, 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 that. Where for her, let's explore. Let's think about this. Let's. So the the caution, if you're like me, don't shut it down. Instead, approach it like this. Wow, that's a fun idea. Here are some ways that I, some things that I think we need to do to make that idea work. Uh, we're going to need to solve this challenge. We're going to need to figure out how to do this. We're also going to need to reprioritize this or this because that will take some resources. Or we're going to have to find out some other resources. But those are some things I think that we could do to make that idea work. Mm. And then what will happen is the visionary will go, hmm, yeah, I see that. You know what? I don't want to do that idea. I like what we're already doing. Or they'll say, you know what? Yeah, I see that. You're right. Let's figure out how to do those things. And yes, let's shift some priorities and make some different choices. And so that conversation can be really helpful um, in 
helping the visionary to sort through their ideas, they need you, they need your help to be practical. And you need them to be inventing the future. That's a, you, you need both. Uh, and so the, a lot of the magic is figuring out how to do that together. Wow. I wish Karen uh, was here so that I can ask her, you know, what uh, about her side of the story also? What would she react to when, when you keep giving, you know, like <laughs> take things slow? So can you answer that question on her behalf since you've been with her sure. for so long? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if she were here, she would tell you some. Um, overall, she's grateful for it. Mm -hmm. She's grateful that I bring what I bring to the, the conversation. Because we had, and she has said this many times, we have, would not have built the business we have built if I hadn't brought those elements to it, that we've been able to, to do far more, reach far more, all, all of that. Mm -hmm. And she would also say, sometimes it's very frustrating. And sometimes she has to say, don't be so negative. And I have to remember, oh, right. Uh, you know, and, and to practice that, what I just shared about to be encouraging and curious first. Uh, and so I think the discipline for both of us and for anybody as you're having these conversations and working through any kind of human conflict, any kind, is curiosity. Let me truly listen to where the other person is coming from. What is it that they're truly saying? Is this, is this something they feel strongly about? Well, why? Mm -hmm. Is this something that's just entertaining and fun? Okay, let me explore that with them. Uh, and that can be hard when we're, you know, feeling the urgency of, pressure, deadlines, and so on. Well, in those cases, I'll say, listen, I really right now I'm feeling really stressed because I've got to get this, this, and this done. So I, can we table this? I'd love to revisit this, you know, tonight or tomorrow morning or, or whatever the time frame is. But just that respect and consideration and understanding that you are different from other people and those differences can be wonderful and build so much more together if we can honor them and get curious about them instead of just being frustrated by them. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. If it's, I, I just have a curiosity question. So when you were 11 years old, you asked uh, your sibling, how can we do it together? And that become your, you know, specialist uh, specialization in this field. And you ask leader now, how can they do that? They, they can do better for their organizations. So it's like it's a very long time. That question is still valid. And what would be the blind side from the organizations and the leadership that they still need help not to see the way to work together uh, more effectively? You know, many uh, organizations, Vivian, they will develop silos. Uh, it's very, very common and, and very natural. And the, the reason that happens is we all have our kind of work. So in our organization, I do a lot of operations, instructional design. I see the world through the lens of the curriculum development and, and all of that and then making things work smoothly. Karen is in charge of sales and marketing, and so she's looking at, she's always thinking about how we can be known, every opportunity to, to, to um, do things. I just don't think that way. Uh, I'm good at the things I'm good at. She's good at the things that she's good at. And there is a tendency in every organization for us to focus narrowly on the things that we're really good at. Mm -hmm. And so those blind spots develop. What good organizations do, what effective leaders do and effective managers is they realize that my job is only partly looking at what I'm doing. It's also to be looking across and engaging with other people and asking those questions of one another, learning how does what I was just working with a global technology company uh, a couple weeks ago and their EMEA head uh, for you know, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia. Uh, he said, one of the most important questions anyone in my division can ask is any leader, how does our work affect other people in this organization? How does it affect other teams? A beautiful question, and it's a leadership question, is, and it keeps us from just looking at our own team or our own product or our own thing is if we can consistently be asking that of ourselves and of our teams, then it forces us to lift our gaze and go, oh, okay. And, and that is half of the work. 
So if we allow it to only be this, then we get stuck, we get blind spots. If we recognize and force our gaze up and build in some structures to help that happen, then that can help us uh, not have those blind spots. So, so how can we help leaders to, instead of seeing in the silo, starting to see that their work, how their works impact other divisions also, other people also? Yeah. Um, you know, a real practical way you can do that is to form a team that has cross-functional responsibilities um, and where they're jointly responsible for things. I'll just give you an example. Uh, uh, another uh, leader that I was talking to who runs an international uh, firm training company like ours, when he was going through this process, what he did to break up pillars was instead of having, okay, there's your operations group, there's your sales group, there's your uh, warehouse group, um, your project management team, and that's the way it used to be, is they each did their individual function. And then the, the client's experience was they'd work with the salespeople, then they'd work with the project manager, then they work with this, and they work with this, and it kind of was disjointed. The way that he reorganized was, he, and he just did a couple, a couple of cross-functional teams where now there's a team of two salespeople, two project managers, two warehouse people, and they're going to have a portfolio of clients where they are their success and compensation elements and all of it related to how that team performs for the client's success overall. Uh, so that was an example. Uh, and, they, and they didn't force anybody to do it. They said, we'll take volunteers. And they did a couple of those. And they found that the people who were doing it that way had way better results. And eventually the whole company said, yeah, we want to do that too, because they saw the, the proof that it, it was more effective. So starting just small with just a little bit of that or just on one topic uh, can be helpful. Um, another is acknowledging the, the fears that are in the room. Uh, in courageous cultures, we talk about this, so, um, call it a fear forage, but when you start having these conversations, normally everybody has some hidden fears that you got to get those on the table and acknowledge that people are worried that, yeah, I may do this, but now nobody else is, and then I'm going to be left standing there looking dumb, and now I'm going to fail at my core responsibilities. So you got to build some structures in to get those things on the table, build the accountability in as a leader. What are you doing to practice accountability to ensure that people truly are working together? And then the, the final piece is a leader, and this is the one that leaders don't like to hear, uh, but is important. Are you preventing the very thing you want? So I'll give you an example from a client, um, engineering firm who uh, really wanted cross-functional cooperation, everybody working towards this new global product launch. Okay. You're very clear on that. Everybody knew this product launch, most important thing for our business for the next two years. Well, his engineering and sales team were just, I mean, yelling and screaming at each other. <laughs> I had never seen that before. It was, it was bad. So I sat down and said, what's going on? Well, it turns out the engineering team, they were devoting 100% of their time to developing and testing the new product. That's what we were told. Number one thing. Well, the sales team, which also included customer service, has a, a bucket of existing customers who are the people most likely to buy that new product. Well, to keep them happy, they needed to service the existing product, which required time from engineering that engineering didn't want to give them. So because they were siloed and engineering was just looking at engineering and sales was just looking at sales, when they would get frustrated with each other, the CEO would get frustrated and say, well, why can't you figure this out? Rather than looking at it and saying, oh, he'd actually created systems that incentivized them to be in conflict. So sometimes you also need to look at your systems and say, are our systems supporting courage, oh. speaking up, collaboration, or are they getting in the way? Wow. And is that related to the books that you are you and Karen is writing about at the moment, the, about uh, conflict at the workplace? Yeah. So the, uh, the 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 and I think that specific story I actually share in courageous cultures, which is about building cultures of 
micro innovation, problem solving, and people speaking up on behalf of the customer and employee experience and building a culture where that's the norm. Uh, the next book we're writing is, yes, about conflict in the workplace, and that's certainly an example of one kind of conflict. It's actually a very common kind of conflict where the structures that we're in are creating conflict between us. Mm. So if, you know, uh, if Vivian and I, if we're having a conversation and we're like, ah, you know, you don't care about this, and she's like, no, David, you don't care about that, and okay, wait a minute. What is it we do care about? What does success look like? And if we realize we have different definitions of success, now we know there's another conversation we need to have. Maybe we need to have it with our manager. Maybe we just need to have it with one another to figure out how we can help each other to be successful and, and achieve the ultimate end, depending on the company we're in. So that is a common form of conflict in the workplace and one that, that we'll definitely be addressing in the next book. Wow. So who would be your target yeah. audience? Uh, go ahead, Vivian. Oh, yeah, just curious. Uh, so nowadays, the workspace is a is a bit more, um, you know, dynamic. People can be in hybrid system, can be in remote. Would that conflict would be dramatically different than what you it used to be? Uh, such a good question. And in our World Workplace Conflict Survey, uh, WorldWorkplaceConflictSurvey.com. If we'd love to get your voice, if you're listening. Um, we are seeing some interesting results so far is that some people are reporting less conflict because they're working from home or working remotely and other people are reporting more conflict because of that so it, it depends on the people and the circumstance uh, and it gets uh, interesting into the details so uh, some people working from home they're just not having any conflicts because they're just avoiding it all and they just do their work but the cost of that is there's less collaboration, creativity, problem solving, which is the healthy kind of conflict. Mm. We need conflict. We need different ideas if we're going to make the best decisions. And so that's the, that's the best kind of conflict. So we want more of that good kind of conflict, less of the destructive that focuses on people and tears down and makes us miserable. We don't need that, but we do need this. Mm -hmm. Well, so we are looking forward to reading your book so that we can share, we can apply to our organization how we can create a good kind of conflicts that foster innovation, foster deeper conversation and stuff. So when is the book going to be introduced to the market, David? Uh, May 2024. So we have more than 14 months now, 13 months from now. From the time we're recording, yes, yeah. yes, it takes a while to get books out in the in the publishing process. Wow, we look forward to 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 reading that book. I have one last question for for you today, and I will reserve the last questions about thinking for Vivian to ask you. Is, uh, so, Vivian, can you help? Yes. Um, so, David, I I learned a lot from your side that since the day that you started to do something, uh, you learn a lot through reading. And this is something that we wrote for the book is thinking with the letter K knowledge. And it seems like knowledge kind of built up a lot for the process of thinking and then you select it from there. And a lot of people would be saying that they are thinking, but they may not equip themselves, you know, to think properly. And you are the thinker. You think a lot how to do it, how to improve things. And we would like to pick your brain on that process. How would you help yourself to expand the thinking? There's always somebody who knows more than you do. Mm -hmm. Who are those people? Uh, so that is one of the things that I have believed in, um, I think, my whole life. Uh, I want to learn something. Who knows this thing? Somebody knows it, uh, and they're, at least they know it better than I do. And I want to find those people. And sometimes that means uh, uh, reading a book. Sometimes that person is dead and they lived a hundred years ago, but they still have that knowledge. And so a book can do that for me. Sometimes they are here today, but it's going to be hard for me to reach them. So maybe I read their articles or, or things or, or and again, reading or watching their videos or, or listening to their podcasts, depending on how you like to get information. And then other times, I'm going to try to have a personal conversation with that person. I've done that many, many times. And so one of my kind of rules, you know, when I'm trying to do something, if I hear it three times that this is the thing to do, I try to take action on it. So I'm two of the books I'm reading right now, it's because I've heard of one of them. I heard it again. I heard it again. That third time, like, I got to read it. 
<laughs> you know, I'll learn something. Too many people have told me you need to do this. Like, okay. And so to learn to, who is it that knows what it is that you want to do? Find those people. And if you truly exhaust that and you know there isn't anybody who knows, okay, now you're in a place of creativity and invention and you know that that's a good place to do. So is there anybody with anything similar that you can learn from? David, you you were mute for about uh, for about ten seconds. So can you can you say oh, the no. last one? Yeah, just sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Yes, I was saying that uh, there's there's so there's always somebody who knows. If there isn't, now it's time to be creative. Now it's time for innovation and creating new ways. And so there's still something you can learn from other people who are good at innovation and creativity. And so as you are needing to do that, you can also learn, okay, what are the kinds of questions they ask? So there's always somebody to be learning from, and that's the way that I approach that. Beautiful, beautiful. I say I have a last question for you, but then I have another one. Is that, you know, and then this is going to be concluding our conversation. Is that okay to ask? Yes. All right. So David, I promised to my, uh, my uh, coach is that uh, I ask every guest a, uh, a bizarre question. So uh, I want to ask you, How's, how's your day looks like? Can you share with us how your days look like? Every day is different. Um, I can tell you today, I'll just share today for an example. Mm. Uh, I don't have any programs today. Uh, many days we're delivering programs to our clients and we do a lot of that via live online delivery, but some of it in person as well. Mm. But today, no delivery. So I started the morning reading one of those books that I mentioned. Uh, then I had an interview, uh, kind of very first thing of business hours. I had a, a LinkedIn live show that I was a guest on where I was talking about leadership and talking about uh, my most recent solo book. Uh, then uh, worked on uh, some client delivery materials that we're working on uh, some card decks. They are card decks with many of our leadership tools uh, for a new client that we're just starting with and then talking with you. And then I have uh, a gentleman from a government agency in half an hour that I'll be talking with. And he has some questions about some of his young leaders and how to support them. Uh, and then the rest of the day, I'll be working on those client materials. And then the final part, I'll be writing that book that we talked about. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for sharing how your, your day looks like to us. Thanks for spending your time with us today, uh, David. And, uh, really appreciate that really love the conversation today please say hello to Karen to Matt and if Jennifer is still there and you know around and you still have connection with her please please send her a message and say thanks for being the first client of yours David right okay I will <laughs> tell her you have a wonderful day and I hope to see you and Karen in Vietnam in person one day okay Oh, it would be our pleasure. Thank you, uh, uh, Vivian, so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You Thank you, David. Bye -bye. Take care now. Bye-bye.